Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. It gives me great pleasure to welcome today's guest, who, according to my notes, has been a Bethelite at Warwick headquarters, no less, up to very recently. Daniel Graves, welcome to the channel. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Lloyd. You and the team. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I know you've been in contact with various members of uh, the JW Watch team, and we're very, very thrilled that you've come forward. Obviously, we want to know what's in your head. <laughs> we, we want as much of what's in your head and your memories as possible because it's all fascinating to us. We're watching this kind of slow motion train wreck unfold, uh, often asking ourselves the question, what would it be like on the inside? So as much as you're, you're able to share, we want to hear. Happy to do that, yeah. So perhaps if we, um, I, I want to skip to the more recent stuff, but perhaps if we go <laughs> back first and establish, uh, you know, at what point or how you got involved with Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, well, I was born and raised. Uh, my mom and dad had gotten that a little bit later in life. And so got baptized around 15 and I was just, that's all I've known. Okay. So you were very immersed in the religion. Uh, did you? I'm gonna. Did you forsake higher education due to your beliefs? No. Um, my mother and father made that option available, trying to be balanced with it, saying that we would support you in pioneering. Uh, in the back of my mind, I always thought I probably should do that, but the more noble thing to do was to go to Bethel to pioneer. And so at 15, I remember we visited New York, and Brooklyn, and I just made it a goal then that I would go to Bethel. And shortly after high school, I went to a little bit of technical college just for a couple of bits of training, but not really a degree and started to pioneer after that. And that less than a year, I got called to Brooklyn and I was in the furniture department helping the first wave of special pioneers leave which was kind of an interesting time to be at Bethel. Um, uh, a lot of Bethelites were shell-shocked during that time. Can you just kind of explain a little, a little bit about the first wave of Special Pioneers? Because, you know, what do you mean by that? I'm familiar, obviously, with the 2015 kind of turfing out of the uh, Bethelites and uh, Special Pioneers. Oh, right. Um, but I, I'm, if you could just add a little bit to what you mean by the first wave. Sure. So back in 2006 and seven, even when I applied, there was the idea that Bethel is not taking anyone in. And actually, they've been starting reassignments. No one had left at that point. But then I was a batch of young brothers at the time that was brought in to accommodate and facilitate the packing up, the shipping. And so these Bethelites now become special pioneers and go to the field. Um, so that was a very interesting time at Bethel. That was the first time that people uh, had an idea that they couldn't just come to Bethel and then die at Bethel, that there would potentially be the option of getting reassigned and having to go out. So dealing with this first wave of Bethelites, uh, there were individuals that were problematic Bethelites that I think Bethel were kind of excited to, to get rid of. And so dealing with them in, um, in that way, and packing up all their stuff and shipping them out, you saw a lot of disgruntled individuals at uh, World Headquarters. So there would have been people saying, I can't believe this is happening. Who do they think they are? Um, Correct. <laughs> voicing voicing their, their grievances. Okay. Yeah, there was actually one individual that lived at the Standish up Columbia Heights that kept delaying, kept delaying, kept delaying. This uh, older, single, eclectic brother, uh, once he went to work, our crew lead came in and said, okay, so this is what we're going to do. And we just took everything in his room, put it on a truck and shipped it out to Long Island where he was going to go with his mother. So Bethel had to take even drastic measures at that point to just get some of these individuals out. So it was kind of an interesting thing to see as a 19 year old, uh, fresh faced Kentuckian in New York and seeing all this un unfold. Okay. And when you say first wave, so 
you, what you're what you're saying is it became a pattern, didn't it? I guess up to 2015, which was when they had the letter read out saying, you know, we're going to be drastically reducing the size of the Bethel family, and we're going to be sending Bethelites into the field to be pioneers. Um, and you're saying that this began as far back as 2006, 2007, but it may have been more to do with getting rid of undesirables. Correct. I think the overhead at Bethel had just become bloated. Uh, I believe that there was a Monday night lecture from uh, Theodore Jarris that kind of kicked that off. And then the, it set and marinated for about a year or two as these assignments came out. And then that was the first opportunity for the United States to try to dwindle the Bethel family. And then, of course, in 2015, it was more of a global initiative where every single Bethel complex, all the branches needed to cut about 25%. So that was more of a direct blow of let's get more commuters and remote volunteers and just dwindle the actual people that we have to house on complex in 2015. Okay. So you were working in the furniture department uh, during this first wave. Did you stay in Bethel at that point or did you end up leaving? I uh, stayed, stayed at Bethel for a little over a year, lived in Towers and 90 Sands. But then at the summer of 2007, um, I left to get married uh, to my ex-wife. And so late 2007 is when we got married around December 23rd. So Christmas time, essentially. Okay. You got married the same year I did. <laughs> so, okay. And uh, what was the plan? Was the plan to, you know, have a quote unquote normal Jehovah's Witness life? Or were you ultimately thinking about going back to Bethel at some point? Uh, thinking about going back to Bethel, my wife's mom and dad, my ex-in-laws, they were Bethelites in the early 80s. And so uh, my ex-wife was kind of born and raised with this attitude of, trying to be proactive and progressive within the organization. She was going to school to be a nurse. So I know that that, would, that was something that we kind of connected with when we met. And that was ultimately the goal, was to pioneer for five years, to try to go to Bethel for another five years, and then maybe have kids down the road. But um, So we stayed in Kentucky. We lived in Lexington, Kentucky, and then um, pioneered for a number of years as she was going through nursing school. And then we, we applied for about four years in a row, did not hear anything. We applied to couple school and evangelizer school, went to the Zimbabwe 2014 international convention, which was really encouraging to us at the time. And then got called to Bethel in early 2015. Uh, we got one month and then we got another month. We got a year. And then after we actually landed from Brooklyn to Warwick, we got invited to be regular Bethelites at that time. Okay, so was it due to attending the convention that you were invited or was it just a coincidence that that happened to be what you were doing in? Um, so, in so, yeah, so when we went to the international convention, it was very odd. We met all these people from Utah. It seemed like all the couple school graduates and MTS graduates were going to Utah. And so because Bethel had not called us at that point, we thought, well, Let's keep wrestling for a blessing, so to speak. And so we wrote the branch and said that we love the convention. It was nice to see the pure language in action and um, the brothers in Africa. But we want to move to where the need is great. And it's come to our attention that Utah seems to be a population that needs to be preached to. So we did write that and we got a letter back saying that we could go to the Ogden or Logan, Utah area. But then shortly after that, we got called to Bethel. So I'm not exactly sure if there were some dots that were connected there, but it did seem coincidental that those things happened within about a four or five month period. Okay, fair enough. So what what happened on your arrival in Bethel? You know, what what assignments were you given? So my wife, for the six plus years that we were there, she's a nurse, um, and so she was working at the various in, uh, infirmaries. In Brooklyn, Warwick, she commuted sometimes to Fishkill, that uh, communal living, and then also eventually at Walk Hill. I had two different assignments, well, three different assignments. The first one was a very brief assignment in the regional design construction department, and I was doing CAD and drafting support. So I was kind of a tech crew. But then shortly after that, I got introduced to the broadcasting overseer. And then my actual first real assignment was for about two and a half years, I was at World Headquarter Broadcasting, 
I was on the international engineer crew. So we would go back and forth between different branches. This was again, right after JWB was launched. So this was trying to help establish these other branches and their broadcasting needs and RTOs. And so there was a lot of communication in that way. I headed up a lot of our documentation with uh, CAD and drafting uh, technical memos back and forth to let them know how to connect different components together to get the standard uh, JWB look, but then also worked in the studio uh, as the teleprompter, worked with the script and worked with the talent. Um, and then... Is that what you're worked- calling it, the talent? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's what we call them, yeah. So, yeah, 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 okay. So, yeah, so worked with the brothers, I should say. That would be more respectful yeah. if I was a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and then also did morning worship camera, um, watchtower camera, did the audio engineer for that. And so that was a lot of different enjoyable assignments that made me at the moment feel this is what it was all about. You know, not going to college, this was this is where Jehovah has you know, richly rewarded me, even though those doubts about the Bible and about the organization were already there, but they were growing a little bit, but those early experiences helped kind of suppress it. Um, But I guess back to your question (laughs) is the next assignment. We, after the Warwick dedication in the annual meeting of 2017, uh, my wife and I went away for our 10 year anniversary and came back. And the day that we landed uh, my overseer and assistant overseer called me into the office and said that I was requested to go to the hospital information department and work as the office manager, the secretary of the overseer, and to be trained in this more technical field. Apparently, some things that I had said uh, throughout Watchtower comments had gotten the attention of um, a helper and a governing body member that they thought maybe this young man has the aptitude to learn and to move forward in the organization. So uh, that was something that was very left field. Um, I had a couple of men that, or elders, as I grew up, that were part of the HLC in Lexington and Louisville and then Cincinnati. So I was familiar with it, but I really, I was not a student of the blood issue. So coming into this and then also working with uh, kind of as a deskman to the HLCs throughout the United States branch, and working the phones and working cases and getting in front of, we would call it the unique ministry. We would go into hospitals, we would be branch representatives and go out and work with the HLC, similar like a CO would work with congregations, but we would encourage them to sharpen their skills and to move forward. So it was a unique assignment. Um, It was satisfying work in some ways, but then also when you would lose these neonate cases and they would die, because of their faith, or they would, um, these mothers who were 23, 24, who would hemorrhage and bleed out, even though they had the opportunity to just get a small transfusion to get them through this crisis, uh, that starts to weigh on you, you know, when you see that, and you really don't believe it, but you're preaching it, uh, that that internal conflict can, can cause some power imbalance and anger issues. <laughs> I can imagine, and do you feel... I mean, obviously, it's difficult to isolate, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back. But was that particular issue perhaps what resulted in you being here today, talking about things from a whole different perspective? Yeah, um, it's jarring enough when you are presented with uh, individuals dying and then you have to reaffirm someone's faith. Um, as a branch representative, that that they did the right thing. That internal strife, that friction, um, you you couldn't deny that. In broadcasting, it was different, way different. But when people's lives are involved and you see it, how it's affected them, or you can sense that a family didn't want to do that or tried to back off from the blood issue, and maybe they would have made a decision to save someone's life and take a transfusion or platelets or plasma, one of those components, Um, and then they lose a family member and you see that their faith has been wrecked in some way and that their family has been forever changed. It, um, the weekends were really bad for me. Um, it would be very busy during the week, but then after service and the meeting, those Saturday and Sunday afternoons, 
this cacophony of this isn't right and you're aiding this really would swell up. So that's something that, especially during COVID, COVID at Bethel was a very interesting time being on lockdown for 410 days. Um, all this kind of came together in this unique ball that even my ex-wife said, I don't want to be here another five years. You know, Bethel makes tends to make people, um, especially her work in the nursing or the infirmary, she would see lots of Bethelites. A majority of Bethelites were on antidepressants and heavily abusing alcohol. Oh, really? So she, correct. Um, much more than I think we were accustomed I'm, to being. Just to be clear, you know this through your wife who was a nurse at Bethel. Yes. So she, yeah. she would never she would never break a HIPAA protocol. Mm -hmm. But she was very surprised at the amount of people that were on anxiety medication, antidepressants, had seasonal affective disorder, uh, anger issues, and then also who were just way above the typical weekly limit of alcohol. And I think even, I mean, myself and my ex-wife included were just introduced to this world where people drank more. And so we started to drink more. Um, yeah, so that was something that at the end of 2020, we thought we have to get out of here. And so that started about a four month process in early 2021, where we slowly started to figure out, well, where do we wanna move? How are we gonna do it? Let's do it the right way. Let's let this um, late 2020 COVID wave kind of peak and break. And then when we go out, we can be a little safer. Um, so that's what we decided to do. My mind's just brimming with questions and it's difficult to, to isolate exactly which one. I'm going to I'm going to drag you back to what you were saying about the the blood issue. So you were working in the hospital information department. It sounds like you were in quite a senior role in that department. Um that department, please correct me if I'm wrong, does it fall under the service department? Uh in smaller branches it will be a desk in the service mm. department sometimes, but it is a department that is right underneath the branch committee. So they will oversee it, but the right. service department, legal and HID, hospital information, typically are kind of in the same realm. Was there a governing body committee that oversaw the HID's work or was it like you say, just directly under the branch committee? So we were a branch department um, hospital information services is the world headquarter department that would be kind of our mother department. And that would fall under the service committee. Yeah. So S Sanderson and company. Yeah. It's interesting how you're saying that something that you said in a, um, in comments at Bethel came to the attention of, it sounds like a, a governing body member or a governing body helper. And they felt that you were, you had the aptitude um, you know, this is the sort of department which I think um, you need to be familiar with if you're going to make serious progress in the organization. You need to see, you need to be, you need to be familiar with the skeletons and welcoming of the skeletons in the closet in order to really rise up the, the ladder. And yeah. I don't think it's any coincidence that each and every one of the governing body members have been have worked in the service department. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you're saying that it's not quite as simple as that when it comes to linking the service department with hospital information department, but certainly the hospital information services fell under the service department. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And, and this was kind of, uh, as I came in, in late 2017, there was a concerted effort by Mark Sanderson, who in Nova Scotia was on the HLC and then worked at hospital information services throughout the 90s doing medical research before he went to service department, then Gilead, then Philippines, and then he came back on the service committee. But he was trying to make a more proactive um, restructuring of HID. So in the summer of 2018, there was a new light about um, the staffing guidelines for hospital information departments, and then also making hospital information, what they were called before was desk. So it would be in the service department, but now we're taking that out and we're giving it a department name. And now you can expand your personnel and we're to be more proactive, harder hitting, go out and hit the pavement. 
And then there was also a new light on um, doctors and nurses that are Jehovah's Witnesses when giving a blood transfusion. And so the previous understanding was that Jehovah's Witnesses that were doctors or nurses could in their own conscience, it would be something that they would have to figure out, um, either aid in a blood transfusion or order or prescribe a blood transfusion for a particular patient that was a non-believer. But now in the summer of 2018, the idea is, and this was with no scriptural backing, all they said was abstain from blood in Acts. And the, it's actually in the correspondence guidelines, I think, that you know you wouldn't be penalized if you were, say, a nurse and you were instructed by a doctor to administer a blood transfusion. Yeah, previously. And then now the idea was that that is objectionable. And that is so closely linked to an unscriptural practice that that has no bearing on your employment at the facility. So if you had to be terminated or go to a different section of the hospital and work in a different role, that's something that you have to do now. And so there was a lot of restructuring and kind of reimagining of what HID and HIS, the world headquarters counterpart, would do. Um, and so that was all part of it. Are you able to tell us, given your seniority in this particular field of of the blood issue of hospital inform of the hospital information department, are you able to tell us to what extent Jehovah's Witness elders and HLC uh, members interfere in the medical decisions made by Jehovah's Witnesses, including when they are facing death? So, the HLC only come when they're requested or they, they are aware of some sort of medical emergency. And at any time, a Jehovah's Witness could say that uh, they no longer want the assistance or the support of the HLC, but it's that's how it's in print in the traditions of men within Jehovah's Witnesses. But in actuality, there's a lot of unspoken pressure for people to, you know, we're spreads quickly within the, a tight knit, high control religion like that. And so someone in the congregation goes to the hospital, the elders are quickly made aware of it. And then the HLC are typically looped in somehow. And then they, they quickly get involved and typically will state their opinion, or this is what we could do. And do you mind if I talk to the doctor? And a lot of those um, brothers and sisters are very happy to have someone who they believe is well informed, but uh, they're not a doctor. These are carpenters and plumbers and good people, but not medically intuitive enough to truly take a stance and be a true liaison. So um, that's where I think the restructuring of the HID was supposed to reaffirm the HLC and, and help sharpen that tool. Mm. But, um, but it, sometimes it can be very, very messy and opinionated. You say that a Jehovah's Witness could theoretically say, you know what, I don't need the HLC. I'm in a position where blood is very likely to be um, prescribed, but you know what, I've, I've got this. I'm on top of this. I don't need the HLC. Surely there would be uh, ramifications in the congregation if a Jehovah's Witness were to say that. Um, <clears throat> if they said, no, I, I don't want help, then typically the HLC would back off. Um, it, it was it was very rare that someone would get disfellowshipped for that unless they were just very blatant about, no, I, I think that that was the right thing. Typically, what I saw often was someone say, no, I don't want your help, get the blood transfusion. And then after they were better, after this medical crisis say, oh, I'm so sorry. And then typically everyone would just say, well, they were repentant and so lesson learned. So it really, it, it's stressed as such an important thing, but in actuality, oftentimes it was just brushed aside, which is kind of interesting that it was so important and yet there weren't really ramifications for it, uh, like fornication or homosexuality or whatever else somebody could do. Hmm. And in the, sorry, what years were you in this particular role? Um. Probably December 2017, all the way up until June 1st, 2021. That was our tip, last technical day at Bethel. Okay. And so in three and a half years of doing this, 
Are you able to tell us how many Jehovah's Witnesses in the United States died? It would be very hard for me to put a number on it because not every case comes to the HLC and not every mm. case that the HLC get comes to the national headquarters. So a lot of things, a lot of the, the trauma, motorcycle accidents, people on blood thinners that just quickly bleed out, we would get wind of that. And every week we were abreast of somebody that had passed away or we would get a note by somebody from the HLC that something had happened. But to actually, you know, collate that and down to a funnel and say, this is the actual number, I just don't think that could ever be the case. Okay. <laughs> if I can press you, sure. would, it, would it be, if there were a number, would it be in the dozens or the, or the hundreds or the thousands? Per day, per month? Or I mean, what are we talking about? In the three and a half year period that you were doing it. Oh, no thousands people mm. it's very common i mean this blood issue especially with covid and some other things that we saw there um it played a role at times and so people go in for a, what would be a normal valve replacement but then they don't have the blood count or the bone marrow to really create baby rbcs reticular sites and then they just naturally become anemic. So many um, sickle cell for little children. That was a sad thing because it's just a small crisis. And if you could just get over that hump, they'd be fine. Mm -hmm. um, and then even um, those trips and falls and just these little random things that would happen that could save a life. Um, not that we would always want to use blood. It's, it really is not always the medically best practice. But sometimes it's the only thing that you can do given a certain circ circumstance. But there were many um, Jehovah's Witnesses that willingly and kind of gladly laid out their lives and labeled themselves as a martyr. Um, so, yeah, around the world in other branches where the medical advances are not as great as Germany or somewhere like the United States, I, I couldn't imagine um, what the number would be totally. But just in the United States, over that three and a half year period, you're saying thousands of people died refusing blood. Easily, I think. I, I would okay. believe, yeah. Okay. And um, in terms of people, you, you've explained that sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses would accept blood. Um, they would, you know, later say, I'm sorry, which is the only way you can get out of it. I mean, in, in as you know, in the Shepherd book, it says, you know, you, you're disassociated if you willfully and unrepentantly accept a blood transfusion. So you can accept a blood transfusion and say you're sorry. And like you say, it's a case of lesson learned. Um, how common was it for Jehovah's Witnesses to, you know, to buckle in that way and to say, you know what, my life's too precious. I'm going to take this blood. Um. There were a lot of cases that I'm sure we were never even abreast of because they just know <clears throat> that they have cancer and certain types of cancers. You have to completely nuke your body with chemo. And there's about a two to three week period where your um, bone marrow is not able to produce anything. And so people just are able to survive only through transfusion. And so I'm sure that there was a lot of individuals that just were able to swallow that and just live it and just never admit it. Um, there were other cases where it was a strong suspicion. The HLC were very eager to maybe take an action. And sometimes we would have to just say, no, it's calm down. We don't have proof of that. Um, and so I, I really also could not put a number on that mm -hmm. as well, because I think in the last four or five years, the organization got a little bit better about being respectful about HIPAA um, certifications, um, uh, and then also not pressing people about medical issues. And we saw that kind of exerted with the vaccinations of COVID too. So you're saying that the organization was less invasive uh, but towards the end of your involvement? I, I think so, because there was a lot of pushback in Europe about privacy laws. And I think eventually uh, we're getting to the point where everything is being, or they were getting to the point where everything was being redacted and they were 
starting to worry about legal ramifications, which kept coming up and up and up. So, um, so I think on that front, they would have loved to be a little bit more assertive and maybe invasive and into medical decisions, but they started to become more aware about the legal realities of the world in which we live and patient autonomy. Mm. And so they kind of were, their hand was forced in a way. Okay. That's helpful to know. Thank you. Uh, there's so many questions I could ask just just on that issue alone, but that's very, very helpful what you've told us. Um, you also worked in the regional design construction uh, department. And I guess when it comes to my kind of day job, I'm really, really interested in your recollections from working on the World Headquarters Broadcasting. Um, did that fall under the audio visual services department? Uh, no. The, at first, there were there are two different camera-based departments at Bethel. There's AVS, audio video services, mm. and they do a lot of creative content, storyboarding, Caleb and Sophia. And then there's the more live broadcasting department, which heads up um, shoot and recording, regional conventions, circuit assemblies, um, also facilitating regional convention equipment throughout the world. And, and then for a time, for about two and a half years, they owned and operated and maintained the JWB studio because it was viewed as a live to tape pre-recording. So it fell under the purview of broadcasting. Um, that has since been simplified and sent over to ABS. And so they now currently do that. And did you, when you were working in that department, did you report to the teaching committee or how did it work? Who was above yeah. you? Yeah, Ken Flodine was our um, teaching committee contact. So he worked very closely with the overseers there in broadcasting. Okay. And so, <laughs> oh God. Uh, so <laughs> you, would, you would have been behind the camera for what was it like for did you go through a period where you were behind the camera for every jw broadcasting episode i actually never did the camera for the broadcasting itself i did camera for morning worships and watchtower for many years but then i was behind the teleprompter in the control mm -hmm. room so i wasn't actually on the floor but i was with the control so every other month there would be me and another uh, a woman that would go back and forth so that was actually kind of a nice thing about Bethel is that working with uh, men and women uh, at that, that particular time, it was nice to actually see that. Okay. And so you, you're, you're working in like the control room on the teleprompter. Were there, were there any funny kind of off camera moments that you can recall or are there, are there any funny stories that you can recount from that period? Yeah. So my first, I think it was, maybe we recorded it in July of 2015. That was my first time behind the teleprompter. So there's a lot, it's a big learning curve. It's something I'd never done before. And that was also the first program that a helper was the anchor. It was Mark Numair. And um, Mark was a really funny guy, very lively, very energetic. And there were times where I would, the teleprompter, I would get behind and he was reading too fast or uh, I was down or he was up. And, and so sometimes he would stop and he would, the floor was in front of the control room and he would turn around and say, Hey, Danny boy, you gotta, you gotta speed up. You gotta follow my lead. Um, so that was kind of interesting. You know, you would hear a little bit more levity and razzing between each other. Um, you would hear jokes that you thought, Oh, okay. Well, that's kind of off color, but that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, we, we also, one time we shot an entire broadcast with, uh, Mark Sanderson on a particular tie. And if you know anything about pixels on a camera and then like certain patterns, you get this thing called moray and it looks mm -hmm. like it's dancing around. And so at the end of it, we realized we have to change out his tie and we had to do it all over again. And you could actually visibly see him frustrated and angry. And he said, you brothers have to get this together. And so you actually saw, you actually saw your overseer get reprimanded on the floor and you're, and everyone's face was red and you're kind of sinking in your chair. Um, so there were moments on the floor that were very candid. Um, 
Yeah. And there would be pre-meetings, like pre-meeting um, where we would get together. Uh, the talent, let's say, for the month would kind of give us a little pep talk and prayer, uh, maybe give us a little insight to what's happening in different lands, which was kind of interesting. Some of those were under ban. And so you would get little snippets. Um, I guess that was like a special treasure or nugget for you. So, yeah, there were a lot of good times, I guess, funny stories that could have been said by that. Okay. So you were working reasonably closely with governing body members and helpers. Yeah. Yeah. And especially with the script, sometimes they would come back and say, you know, the verbiage or the language here, can we just change it? I don't feel comfortable with that. And so you would get to work with them a little bit. And then you would also see them on the floor. It would take maybe a morning or maybe go into the afternoon a little bit. So you could be around them for about five to six hours. Um, you would have different breaks at 1030, then lunch at 12. So Bethel would get um, lunch shipped in. So you would sit and you would kind of hear them tell stories and you'd get a little bit more of a personal take on their personality, not the polished uh, welcome brothers and sisters, you know, mm. that, that version, the watchtower voice. Mm. And uh big question, does Tony Morris have a hip flask? <laughs> not, <laughs> not that I saw it. It could also have been in his sock. I'm not sure. So, you know, okay. Know. <laughs> okay. No, seriously. Cause uh, you know, I, I mean, surely it must've been noticeable. I mean, if it, it feels like, when I'm when I'm watching his videos, I mean, some are, some are better than others, but you know, there are some where the slurring is so noticeable. Surely it was not if it's noticeable for me. Surely it was noticeable for those you know working behind the camera. Yeah, um, I can't say specifically about any of the governing body members, but there were times I would get into the elevator, and you would see a branch committee member. And the eyes would be a little glassy. Uh, a lot of these, and like I said before, um, my ex-wife had noticed that a lot of Bethelites drink, not just on the weekends, kind of like my ex-wife and I did, but it was throughout the week and it was multiple uh, after five. And so sometimes you would get in the elevator and you would smell something on someone's breath and you would think, interesting, you know, and then later you would see them uh, for morning worship and they were talking about balance and modesty and you would say, okay, I see you, I see what you're doing. <laughs> mm. So, so yeah. Okay. You're a bit, you're being a bit guarded about Tony Morris. He, he's, and he's the one that I'm most interested in hearing stories about. You don't have any Tony Morris stories for me. I don't. Um, yeah. I'm trying to reflect on that. I didn't, I wasn't around him a lot. I think okay. there, were, there was a month or two that I missed him because it was the other um, cruise opportunity. So the sister, mm -hmm. she did that one with, with Tony. Okay. And you will have also presumably been uh, required to watch what came to be known as the Pillowgate video. It so was released. Was yeah. So when about when I moved over to Walk Hill, that was maybe the first month where we sat down and we watched we saw gary bro talk about pillows and dancing and wrestling with fellow bethelites and then even in, in the hid department we had a what was called an hlc video conference but because that immediately got leaked um they actually canceled our video conference because of security concerns so that was kind of interesting to there was a lot of suspicion that someone in broadcasting leaked that to um, apostates, to you uh, and other people like you. <laughs> so, so that was a big talk about Bethel and there was a lot of concern and things were very, very locked down after that for a time. Yeah, I can imagine. It, it feels like, um, well, I noticed things get locked down and to some extent the leaks kind of dried up. They've thankfully started to flow a little bit more since then but uh yeah i can imagine it being uh <laughs> lots of paranoia around that time but it was quite damning material wasn't it surely when you saw the pillow gate footage you must have been saying what on earth's been going on here you know yeah and especially since i had the context of being at bethel 
as a 19, 20 year old. And then some time went by as an elder for over six years and then being able to be at Bethel for a little bit longer and see what it is now and then see that video. I thought, okay, well, obviously there's enough material that they needed to actually stress this with new ones. And I can't imagine being a 19 or 20 year old. And that's, that's what you see in orientation. That's your welcome to Bethel video about sexuality And I don't know how I would feel if I was a 19 or 20 year old and then have to watch this um, by a branch committee member and a helper to the service committee say these types of things and think, well, what type of sexual repression am I about to encounter at this place? Um, And all of it is really, um, especially even just being out about five months now, I've unpacked a lot of (laughs) my sexual repression and you think how troubling it is for high control religious groups to do these types of things and to put limits on even what a a husband and wife can do. So those types of things, I, um, but it was damning. Um, I remember thinking, I can't believe I'm watching this. I can't believe this was produced and it's taken with a serious approach to it. Absolutely. I I mean, I, I think, you know, all joking aside, that was a very serious and disturbing element to the whole pillow gate. Uh, rebuttal for me when I was recording it was you know this really does highlight just how far the control goes and how invasive the control is you know when people's sexuality is being policed in this way Um, you mentioned before about sorry go on I was just going to say on that note you you kind of jogged my memory Um, I had been in a couple of different congregations and, and sometimes you, you hear some things like, okay, that was a weird sexual thought that individual had, but especially at Bethel, cause everything, it's just a pressure cooker. You are living in, you know, institutional living like a prison or a nursing home. So there would be some very, very odd cases that popped up at Bethel. And I think that was a really great window into the type of like, if you keep pushing something down, eventually somewhere it'll pop out and something weird will happen. And it always happened uh, at Bethel. And so I think that was a really great thing to have been leaked because it's very truthful historically about Bethelites and even the the pressure for single men, if they want to stay at Bethel, there's always this idea of if I tried to get married where we might not get accepted. So I'm just going to be single for my entire life. Um, and then that that all that always causes some other sexual repression and frustration that plays out in different ways. Yeah. Are there any videos you've seen as a Bethelite that you look back on now and wish that video could be leaked? Hmm, that's a good question. There are a couple of safety videos out there that seem to that seem that would would be kind of nice out. Um, especially some manuals, you know, department manuals are starting to become a little bit more of a, or department guidelines that they try to use guidelines as opposed to manual, but really it's a manual for the department. Um, There were some things that we had in the HID that were made for Gilead students that I think um, would be good to be out there. But I really don't think there's like a vast uh, database of information that hasn't in some way found the light of day. The things that really need to be out there, I think are out there. And especially with the advent of the internet, that's why more and more young ones are not coming into the truth in the fullest way, or they are going to school. They're moving um, forward. There was a big concern at Bethel that we're losing an entire generation of young people. And so the idea was train people in their, late twenties and early thirties. And I guess I was a part of that to take on the torch. And so the a whole generation was kind of leapfrog as they went from 50, 60 year olds down to 30 year olds. Um, so to try to retain some youth in the organization. Okay. How much access does the Bethel family have to historical materials? So to materials that are older than the material that is on Watchtower library? Mm, that's a great question. So uh, Watchtower Library is a software that we all have, right? Or you have, you could get access to it, but there's a different version, um, the Bethel Family Watchtower Library, which goes all the way back from even secular sources of the 1800s. And so they do have some stuff. 
Um, there does appear to be some redacting on that software. Uh, I was doing some research and I thought that's not what was in print here. So things are updated just like on JW library app, you know, things are revised and updated and you go back to the original in print and you think this doesn't, they've updated it to reflect better for the organization. Oh, okay. So, uh, so literally, you know, talking about Watchtower Library, so you're a Bethelite and you go on Watchtower Library for Bethel and you can, you can read any publication. You could read a 1919 Golden Age on Watchtower yes. Library. Yeah. Okay. And then there were even different permissions on top of that. Like um, for HID, we had a different version that had all the service department guidelines and all the service department manuals about how to answer phones, um, some legal material, all talk outlines, regional convention outlines. And so I guess the higher up you are, or in a certain department like writing, um, service department, legal, HID, you would have different permissions that would give you more of a, a scope of really what the organization is doing and the material that's out there. But but you're also saying that despite this, this different version of Watchtower Library, which really all Jehovah's Witnesses should have access to, despite Bethelites having this version, you're saying that it was being tampered with so that anything that was embarrassing or that they no longer agreed with was now worded differently. There were differences between what was actually printed and then what was retained. So even if uh, like on our phone, the purple app, we use that, you'll see that things are updated, verbiage has changed from time to time. And so even Jehovah's Witnesses publicly, just publishers can actually see an update versus what was originally printed in the Kingdom Rule Book in 2014 and what's currently on the database. So th that same thing happened with the Bethel Family Watchtower Library. But would it be used, I mean, obviously we're aware of kind of procedural updates and this is the new procedure and what have you, but in terms of, you know, did they use that strategy for covering up embarrassing things that they said about say 1925 or 1975? Um, that I couldn't attest to, but I know that the writing department would use those informations. And so there mm. would be some updates that were different. Um, the vernacular would change or there would be something that was a little bit more gracious and seasoned with salt as opposed to what was originally maybe a hard line. So I think that there were changes, especially for someone like the writing department that would use this tool to actually write new material it would be used in a different way. Okay. And earlier you mentioned about, you know, the fallout from Pillowgate and how there was, you know, paranoia about, you know, who might be leaking material to apostates. Um, to what extent, to what extent is the Bethel family mindful of apostates? I mean, pr presumably it's a, it's kind of a bit of a taboo because, you know, in order to get your work done in Bethel, you can't think too much about, you know, what critics are saying or even the existence of critics. But I'm just interested to know, in, in your experience, how much of a factor apostates play in the thinking of people in Bethel? Um, Bethelites are terrified of apostates, terrified of apostates. Um, even at morning worship to the entire U.S. Bethel family, Puerto Rico, San Juan, everyone's included. When there was a planned rally around either Warwick or surrounding kingdom halls in the area, it would be announced Thursday or Friday that this weekend we encourage you not to go out in service, not to go to your territory, but to stay on complex and not to engage with anyone that appears to be in street clothes or with a beard or picketing, sandwiching, whatever, the, you know, tinfoil hats, the craziness that, that goes on with apostates, at least from a Jehovah's Witness perspective at Bethel. So it was, it was something, there were emails sent out about it. There were announcements at morning worship. So when there was something planned, they would inevitably get wind of it and try to let the family know in some way. Um, I remember even one time on a Saturday, we get this random email that's an urgent in all caps to return to your complex and stay on complex because of an apostate attack is how it would be 
um, host to us. So, so of course, Bethelites are very, very cautious about it. And there's even a just a no overall tem, uh, temporal feeling for Bethelites of even if I were to talk to someone out in the ministry and they tell me they're an apostate, I better go back and tell someone at Bethel because what if they find out that I talked to an apostate and I didn't confess my sins, uh, I could get in trouble. So there's a very big fear mongering around it. It, it okay. plays a part in the psyche of a Bethelite for sure. You would have been in Wallkill uh, in November 2019 when I took a little ride on Stirling Forest Lake with my colleague <laughs> okay. uh, with, a, with a sign. Um, and apparently, well, not apparently, we did send uh, Warwick Bethel into lockdown. So it could have been maybe that was the Saturday or I don't remember what day it was actually, but maybe you'll have had an email about that in all caps. Yeah, actually... <laughs> Funny, funny story about that. Um, there was there was a friend who lives in Charlotte. He's out now and he's put out a great YouTube video uh, about his experience. But he was actually at Warwick at the time and he was awake, but he was just kind of going through the motion. Family was trying to rally him. And then they they there's this big hubbubaloo about, oh, there's an apostate on the grounds. And, and he just remember being awake. And experiencing that at Bethel and thinking, this is crazy. So even myself waking up and leaving, um, having that conversation with him has been interesting for Imagine. sure. And, and, and I would say even to your question about how much of an impression it makes, back in 2013-ish, I came to the conclusion that I didn't believe witnesses had it correct. In about 17, I believe that the Bible wasn't correct and a lot of other religious texts, but I had never dabbled, even though I was technically awake and just trying to work things out in my mind, how I would leave. I never looked at apostate material until the day I disassociated myself. And then when you go and start to read these articles and you go down the YouTube rabbit hole, it is just what a, breath of fresh air that was and just reaffirming and, and all the things that I was thinking about Noah's Ark and the Tower of Babel and the generations between only three generations where did all these people come from and um, anyway it, it all just helped solidify but even that I couldn't be in and look at apostate material because there was just such a demonizing view of apostates so I think that kind of also plays into the psyche of Bethelites and Jehovah's Witnesses in general, thinking that in some way it's just going to spill out of an apostate and by osmosis infect you. It's interesting what you just said there. You, you just said, you just admitted that as far back as 2013, you'd come to the conclusion that Jehovah's Witnesses were not correct. And as far back as 2017, uh, you'd concluded that the Bible wasn't correct. So you were... You were involved in making JW Broadcasting episodes as someone who already had, quote unquote, apostate views. And, you know, you were involved in the hospital information department um, doing work, which I think it's safe to say you now regret as someone who even had doubts about the Bible. So how do you how do you account for that? What, how do you explain this kind of mental disconnect that you obviously experienced? Yeah, I think there was a moment in 2013 where I was ready to pull the trigger and I didn't know how exactly that was going to go with my ex-wife or my family. Um, but my father had some troubles and he had a crisis of conscience in some way. And, and he did some things that got him disfellowshipped. And even though I felt similar about just the Jehovah's Witnesses, I felt a family obligation to stay in and to support my mother through something. And I guess in some way I was happy that I was able to do that, um, to be her rock through some situation. But then you try to keep just moving forward and push it down and repress it and think, well, because at that, that moment I'm trying to sit between two chairs and I knew eventually I would either fall between them both or have to pick one or the other. And in some way, I thought maybe I can suspend my disbelief even further and live out the rest of my life. And you were just having this internal conflict. And that's where I think for me, especially when we moved to Walk Hill, 
and I had to do these things that I thought were egregious, that there were moments where I would have drinking bouts on the weekends. And I was just trying to calm myself down and trying to forget about this. And I've been going to therapy and that's been amazing. Um, but my therapist has talked about the power and balance that you are going through and how that can cause anger issues. And so there were bouts where I was very angry when I would drink. Um, I've since, it has almost all gone away, which has been amazing to feel. Um, I wouldn't drink every day, but there were moments on the weekends where I would have bad bouts. And um, so I didn't get out unscathed for sure. You know, I'm mm. very imperfect. We all are. And so I had moments that I regret throughout the last three years. But I think when it came down to it, it was eventually just me and living my life versus do I do this in servitude to a God that I don't believe, an organization that I don't believe, only for familiar family roles. And to a point where it was now becoming a detriment to me. And I didn't want to become um, an alcoholic or a drunkard. So I just knew I could, I could play that out and say that if I stayed in here, I'm going to lose my mind and I'm going to become something that I hate. And so at that moment in uh, July 1st, so we were officially no longer Bethelites June 2nd, then July 1st, I disassociated myself thinking, okay, I, I, I can leave now. This is the appropriate time. And was it so only if, after, the, sorry, go on. No, so so to your point, just kind of in summary was, yeah, there were a couple of moments where you think, okay, now I can leave. Then something happens that keeps you in. Um, and then we got called to Bethel. And again, like I said before, there was uh, there was a lot of fun times there. People who were like-minded. I did meet individuals who were open-minded and progressive, at least what I thought was the best that Jehovah's Witness can be, liberal or pro progressive or whatever. And so there were things that I thought, well, I, maybe I can do this for another year. And you just start nickel and diming yourself. And then I realized I just turned 35 and I just realized, wow, I'm in my mid thirties. And, and I could have left in, you know, late twenties and I could have maybe gone through college, get my communications degree. There's so many things now that I'm pursuing that I'm excited about, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very crazy how cerebrally I knew but then emotionally, you're just tied to family. You're tied. That emotional blackmail wears on you over time. If you could put a percentage, I mean, obviously, again, I'd, I'm not expecting concrete figures, but if you had to guess uh, how many Bethelites in the United States Bethel family um, harbor doubts about the organization, uh, what would you guess? <clears throat> I know there were individuals that I've, I had conversations with that they almost immediately right off the bat said, um, it, it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be changes. I don't believe this current new light because it's, it's going to change. We don't know. And so there was just this over when you really start to talk to people, especially in service department that have high responsibility, um, those other ones, maybe in the legal department that have some sort of secular education, you do get a sense that they're kind of just going with it for now and that there's going to be new changes. There's going to be new light and they're not letting that affect their faith. But to put a percentage on the Bethel family, I mean, maybe 10 to 15 percent are just doing it or maybe they're 45, they're 50 and they feel like there's a sunken cost fallacy. I, I can't leave now. Mm. I can, what am I going to do? If I leave Bethel now, do I go back to school? Do I, I mean, I, I haven't paid into the system. I've lived under a vow of poverty for 20 years. So how would mm. I make a living? And so that's kind of just a, a survival mode. And I, I've really met some people in their late forties and fifties that I thought, I think you're just running the clock out. And that's a little sad, but you maybe feel stuck and that might be the only viable option for you. Could you just kind of expand you, because you've just mentioned there the vow of poverty. Um, could you just expand on what that is and what it means? So essentially it's kind of legally like you are 
declaring yourself a monk. Um, they're, they're able to use your services and not fairly compensate you for that. So you don't have a salary, you have a stipend. Uh, for myself, it was 150. My ex-wife was 150. So for a couple, it was 300. And so then, this is this per month? Per month, yeah. So, so as a couple, you were making $300 per month as Bethelites. Yeah. 300 big ones. That's right. Okay. And so then at the end of the year, they would have, they would give you a personal expense account, which based on how many years of special full-time service you had, I think we tapped out, but it was maybe $1,500 for the year. And so a lot of Bethelites at that time would suit buy a new iPhone. They'll be set for the year, but um, you do have your room and board. They, they provide meals uh, there's a shoe shop, there's dry cleaning, there's laundry, there's vehicle maintenance, there's maintenance for your room. And so a lot of things are cared for you. Um, and that's what the vow of poverty is. You are saying that you're okay with that. And it's a legal binding document where you don't have to really pay into taxes and things like that or social security. Well, so if, that you was were day to, one. if you were to come across some money, you'd have to declare that, wouldn't you? You would, yes. Or um, what the Bethelites would call it G-jobbing, which stood for, I guess, from the 70s, gravy job. You know, it was like, oh, I made a lot of gravy this weekend. You would have to take a either a Friday or maybe a half day off. But if you took a half day off, then the rest of the weekend, you could technically be on your own time, your vacation time, and you could go make money but you would have to declare that. And at the end of the year, you would work with the accounting department. But there were a lot of Bethelites that never declared it. You know, you should, legally, you should. And of course, there were ones that had, as nurses, they had jobs in the city. And so every other weekend, they would go in and do two 12-hour shifts, Saturday, Sunday, and they would make a lot of money from the city. And then they would bring that back and everything's cared for. And they would buy nice new purses or beautiful new suits or whatever it was but um so there was that but let's say seedy underbelly as well <laughs> so as someone who made 150 dollars per month um and clearly took the vow of poverty seriously you know what's your reaction to Stephen let going halves on a five hundred thousand dollar property in 2013 I did not know that. That is new <laughs> information to me. Um, I, I think that's very interesting. I mean, it's certainly, I think if you're an ambassador of the organization or you're what they call a branch rep and you go to visit the field, um, I experienced a lot of generosity from the HLC members when you would go out and do HLC seminars or you would work with them for a week. They would take you to very nice dinners and just go to the moon and back and they would give you green handshakes as you're coming home. You would be stuffed with a lot of cash. I couldn't imagine if you were a branch committee member, um, a helper to the governing body or a governing body member. I'm sure that some of these individuals are getting almost a monthly stipend from individual benefactors on the outside that are saying, hey, we love you. We appreciate what you do. Here's your monthly a thousand or four thousand dollars. I'm sure that a lot of those higher ups are getting more money than they know what to do with. And, and of course, the way it's worded, the vow of poverty, is that the order can decide to what extent it's enforced. And of course, who's in charge of the order? It's the governing body. So it's, it's <laughs> very open to corruption, isn't it? Really, when you think about it. Yeah, it's, there's not a lot of transparency. It's not opaque to the Bethel family. But if you're working in those different departments in the treasury or in the different accounting departments throughout the branches, you're going to be able to see a little bit more of that, those finances and, and from what legal entity they go around. Because there's many, there's like 30 plus legal entities uh, that the Jehovah's Witnesses can play with. And speaking of finances, on an organizational level, uh, obviously you weren't working in, you know, the financial department or, or doing the accounts, but you know, presumably you'd get a feel from speaking to people, uh, you know, how the organization was doing financially. Um, are they in trouble? Uh, are they ticking over nicely? Is everything fine for them financially? What's the, what's the gossip? <laughs> yeah, I guess the gossip would be that they're 
very, very rich. There's a lot of different offshore accounts that they have. And especially with, uh, there was an individual in the Germany branch, Glockentin, who got pulled over. And he's a helper to the governing body now, but he's the overseer of the Treasury Department. And he was kind of lauded as a rock star of the financial world and had a lot of tricks up his sleeve. So to what extent they actually have money, I'm not sure. Uh, I did talk to a brother in the Treasury Department. The first time I ever remember and being shocked that the organization was asking for money, I think it was a 2015 broadcast where Stephen Lett was talking about finances and, and we should we should donate out of our, not our surplus, but even our ones to build the world headquarters. And this brother that worked in the treasury department said, the brotherhood just poured out more than I've ever seen in any accounts. So I know from that point on, the governing body periodically talked about finances a little bit more openly. Um, so a lot of that money is stuffed in lots of different corporations throughout the world and lots of different entities. That's very interesting what you've just said about Gaius Glockentin, because bear in mind, in the last convention, he was the one that got tasked with um, giving the talk on on donations, on the need to give money. And you've just told me that he's the overseer of the Treasury Department. So that's that would fall under That would fall under his purview. And he, of course, would be able to speak freely about that because he works with it every single day. And he feel, report he directly reports to the governing body about their own money. I feel like now that you've given me that gem, I'm I'm, I'm mindful of how much time you have, and I I have a, I like only a finite amount of time too. But I'm actually wondering whether we could I could just rattle off some names, sure. and you could give me like a one sentence. Here's, here's the most interesting thing I know about this person. One or two I'll sentences. It, I'll give it my okay. shot, yeah. Uh, and I'm literally just going to go through the list of, first of all, I'm going to go through the list of helpers and then I'm going to go through the governing body members. So John Ekrin. John Ekrin, um, Bethel's golden child. Very highly praised and loved at Bethel. Um, the governing body have immense, immense faith in him. They wish they could probably clone him. <laughs> well, it's interesting because he is the one and only helper on the coordinators committee. And that kind of tells you. So basically, he's just working with governing body members. So that kind of tells you he is something special. Yeah. Um, Patrick LaFranca. Mm. He was, yeah, he's the overseer of the legal department for the U.S. branch side, and he's a branch committee member. Um, I don't really have anything shell-shockingly interesting about him. It's helpful that he's the overseer of the legal department. This is all helpful. Um, Ralph Walls? Um, another uh, Bethel Golden child could probably do no wrong. Um, yeah, I, I can't think of anything that I Okay, need to share. that's fine. Uh, Harold Corkin? Uh, well, the overseer or the, the coordinator of the branch committee for the United States, um, he he is a very meek person, um, doesn't have a great personal you know, aura about him, but um, was respected, very yeah. kind. You've told us already about Gaius Glockenton, so I'll just skip along. Uh, Robert Lucioni? Robert Lucioni... Um, he is in charge of the uh, WDC World Design Construction, and he takes over a lot of money for the organization and their building. So he has immense faith, uh, or he is given immense faith in the in the organization, especially the role that he's been given. Okay, Alex Ryan Muller. He used to be the treasurer overseer, and then uh -huh. Glock and Team came, and he got moved from treasury overseer to. WDC and helps the WDC with their funds. So there was an interesting time at Bethel where it was like, oh, what happened with Alex? He didn't do morning worships for a while. Then he did one broadcast and then he got yanked off that rotation. So I, I don't know. 
I don't know exactly. Do you think he might have been a naughty boy? <laughs> Maybe he, he got spanked. Yeah. He because got he wasn't he wasn't on the 2020 speakers for the convention. He wasn't on the 2021 convention speakers. And frankly, he's a better speaker than many of the speakers who were used, which tells me that he's fallen from grace. Uh, yeah, I, but I think there's, there's overall, I think there's an impression about Alex that he's a little full of himself, that he knows that he's good and maybe they're trying to just put him and teach him a lesson. I'm not sure, but there is that overall thought about Alex. This is incredibly helpful. Um, I could do this all day. Gary Bro. Gary Bro is uh, larger than life. He walks around Lock Hill kind of like a cowboy. Very gregarious. Um, loves to come up and kind of grab you by the shoulders. Very tactile person. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Joel Dellinger. He really is that way in real life. Um, he is oh, not so he like, really is mini let in real life. He really, he <laughs> truly is. Uh, my, my ex-wife and I lived around the corner from them at Warwick for a little over a year. Um, and just very, very like a mini let, very much like that in life. It's not a show. It's who okay. he is. Fair enough. Uh, Seth Hyatt. Seth Hyatt is a very good man. Uh, I actually still do have a lot of love for him. He was the helper that kind of identified me and we bonded uh, over our father's past failings, but um, I do love him. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Christopher Maver. <laughs> Interesting fellow, um, kind of full of himself a little bit more than I, I would think than Alex Ryan Mueller, but he is in good graces. I think he has been friends with the right people at the right times and there's somebody protecting him, I think. But I, I think I think he is trusted by the right person. Fair enough. This is brilliant. I'm I, I could, really enjoying this. Uh, William Turner. William Turner. Yeah, I don't, don't really have anything groundbreaking. Always solid speaker. Uh, would like to see him and and people of. Yeah, I would like to see him probably more often than others. Leon Weaver. Dream Weaver, we would call him. Um, Leon Weaver, <laughs> um, good man. Yeah, can't can't really say anything else. Yeah, uh, Ron Curzon, uh, the overseer of AVS. So he's the contact for the teaching committee of AVS, but um, he is also liked, I believe, by the right people, and he was given the pathway in some ways over others who maybe have more talent, but he has the right moldable personality. Hey, I think you can even see in his teaching, he's not the strongest speaker. There are others that are better, but I think he's given a lot of grace because he has the right type of personality. He's a company man. He's, he's the EM, EMH, I feel. He's like the medical holographic program that you boot up <laughs> to, uh, to deal with the situation. Um, and he took over from uh, Ken Floding, was it, um, in doing the ABS department? Yeah, I when think, yeah, when broadcasting was established in late fourteen or middle of fourteen, and there was a new project by Brother Let Stephen Let, then Floding had enough in ABS clout that he got moved over, and he was going to be the the face of broadcasting and be that con to yeah. Okay, and uh, what can you tell us about Ken Floding? Um, surprisingly very secular. He's, he's probably the most secular individual that I've met in the organization. Of course, he's religious, he's spiritual, but he's very factual, very straight ahead. And when you're in a meeting with him, you feel like you're with a corporate giant, which was the only really person that I've met that kind of had that disposition. Interesting. I always think of him as a little bit like of an understudy to Tony Morris because he seems to have Tony Morris's anger issues mm. with the with the bread in the bin and with the smashing the glass. But yeah, yeah. okay, maybe there's another side to him. Okay, uh, William Malenfant. Malenfant, um, I think, was the older generation's 
John Ekron. I think he could do no wrong. And he honestly, just like Rob Lucioni, was 100% every single time. He would get an assignment and just kill it. His talks, great. Um, it's a shame for the organization standpoint that they view him as getting older. He had to give up his oversight in 80, when he turned 80. I think he's 86 now, but still very sharp. Sure. Uh, Mark Numer. Mark Numer. Um, yeah, I mean, great teacher. I think very, very um, sure of himself. And he runs a tight ship in the teaching. What is it? What is that committee? It's the, it's the theocratic the schools. It's the theocratic schools. Department. Oh yeah. He's the, he's the Gilead uh, instructor, isn't he? Yeah. So when he yeah. got brought in, he kind of cleared house and brought his guys in and really built his own ship. He, he runs a tight ship and he doesn't take a lot of guff from people. Okay. Uh, David Schaefer. David Schaefer, um, great mind. Don't really have any gossip about him, but um, yeah, very interesting and intriguing person. His smiles always look very very forced to me when he's speaking. Well, it's almost like must if, smile. <laughs> if, if you if you go back and watch the the 2013 U.S. branch visit, I think that was the first time he was really used in a mighty way, and I believe over the years at Bethel that I saw him, he has become kind of like David uh, Splane. He has tried to put on a little bit more of a forced lovey-dovey because he is very cold and calculating, not in a negative way, but he's just, that's his demeanor. So I think there's, he's trying to pour a little sugar on it and trying to make it sparkle a little bit like, uh, yeah, David. Sh uh, and sometimes the sugar comes spilling out a bit too abundantly. <laughs> okay. Fair yeah. enough. Uh, Robert Saranko. Robert Serenko. Um, sometimes I forget he exists. I don't mean to be mean, but he's just, you know, there. He he does a fine job at whatever he does. I, I don't even know what he's he's, a he's bit working. Dull. Yeah, yeah. He he's working in the writing department. He's probably some sort of oversight in there. Yeah. Uh, James Mance. James Mance is David Splane's protege. He works it works in the writing department has a lot of trust from the writing side of things uh especially the work that he did in japan when he was over there interesting um isaac murray yeah um i always appreciated him and his thoughtfulness he is a bit dull but um, he always cuts through with some interesting tidbit he was very um he's very tech savvy and he's very forward thinking in those ways uh, I just, I think, a couple more names. Uh, Leonard Myers. Can't say anything. Okay. Just uh, yeah. And Hermannus Van Selm. Van Selm. Also one of the uh, the writing department helpers. Um, kind of got added in later in his life, but there must have been something that he did that got a lot of grace with that one big thing because he got kind of everything at once. He just kind of exploded at Bethel maybe four years ago. I've got actually Gene Smalley on my list on, on the JW.org page, but we yeah. don't really see him on camera. He's still around, is he? He is. He's, uh, he's doing morning worship and he was very instrumental in writing throughout the decades. He was one that really first started the blood issue and the blood committees in the seventies and eighties and wrote a lot of these first documentations before HIS became a department in late 1980s. Okay. Uh, well, that's very helpful. Thank you. We'll just rattle through the, uh, if, if you have time, we'll just rattle through the governing body members. Uh, let's start with David Splain. David uh, Splain is really trying to be, more gregarious um don't really have anything big to say about that or him he is a little pedantic you can kind of tell in, in person his aura is uh, a little full of himself sure uh anthony morris didn't have a lot of experience with him but a little bit larger than life um yeah has a big soft spot for his kids uh, that work at Bethel there and really push them ahead. I think there's a bit of nepotism there, of course, 
because of the last name. And did you uh, did you ever meet his his sons? Yeah, one worked in MEPS and the other one works in the branch committee office. So Jesse, I believe, has a lot of responsibility at U.S. National Headquarters. And then Paul, I believe his name was or is, he works in MEPS. And so okay. they're very, very different. But yeah, I've, I've met them. OK, um, Stephen Lett. He is that way. I mean, he just walks around very much like a Gary bro, kind of gregarious and pointing fingers at people. And um, yeah, I don't really have anything to say gossip or slander wise. <laughs> But, but when he's speaking normally, he, he doesn't speak in that kind of theatrical way. Not necessarily in the theatrical way, but it's very bombastic and, and it's it's close to that. I think close. He, right. I think I think that he's just always in the role. I think mm. that he's lost himself in that role. OK. Um, Sam Hurd. Sam Hurd is a good man. Very dry, very funny. Um, don't really have anything more than that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Garrett Loesch or Lush? Lush. Um, he's getting older and his mind is frail right now. Um, he's going through different health crises. I don't want to talk too much about, oh, you know, his fine, personal yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kenneth Cook. That was a surprise to the Bethel family when he was announced, but he was the first governing body member that was just basically born and bred at Bethel, did not have any field experience. And you can kind of tell it. He's very procedural traditions. Okay. Uh, Mark Sanderson, you've already told us quite a bit about him, but if you could sum up. Um, probably the one that's driving the ship the most right now, which is kind of a surprising thing for a lot of people. They may think someone who is very vocal like a Morris, but uh, Sanderson is very instrumental right now and in trying to really steer the organization somewhere specific. That's interesting. Very um, intricate. I, I can imagine. And actually out of all the governing body members, I'm surprised they don't use him more because um he is the most natural on camera and therefore i think the most convincing if i can put it well, that way yeah most yeah. effective uh, and jeffrey jackson jeffrey jackson is so smart uh he's very very intellectual and i think some of his talks are very interesting um yeah i don't really have any okay. deep insights to the man Fair enough. Well, that was really interesting. I've, I've actually expanded my knowledge of okay. <laughs> gov governing body members and helpers just by doing that exercise. And I'm sure the viewers will have found it interesting too, especially those who, like me, are kind of nerds for this sort of thing. Um, you know, looking back, I guess your journey is is still very raw. I mean, for you to have disassociated as recently as as June you know it must be still like a very a very recent thing in your mind but um you know do you regret leaving the organization do you feel comfortable and confident about the road ahead for you personally i don't regret it um i think that i tried to give it every thought process every pause and i tried to really wrestle for that blessing until there could have been a breaking point where I would have become something that I didn't want to become. Uh, of course, um, with my ex-wife, what was said was, this is not what I signed up for. Even though we, we talked and she would maybe be even categorized as a feminist and proactive and progressive in her liberal thoughts, there just was, I can't leave my family. And I tried to make it work. Of course, that is a failure. Um, we're divorced now. But it has been hard. I've had some of the most brutal breakdowns of my life, but I've also had some of the highest highs uh, it just in a five month period. My life has gotten bigger. The ceiling for what my potential can be has gotten just exponentially um, mind altering. I've met people that have enriched my life that I know that moving forward are going to continue to do that. And I feel like I definitely have a road ahead of me full of not only activism, but just community service. Because that's something that I always enjoyed is outreach, 
but I never enjoyed reaching out about the Bible or the Jehovah's Witness organization. So I think I, I'm trying to look back, not as a revisionist history, but take all the good I can and now put it into a communications degree and working with disadvantaged youths or battered women and nonprofits. So I think I'm, I'm very happy that I really gave it a go and I'm happy for what's ahead. And I think that people that are currently in, maybe that are watching this for the first time in secret, really think about it, really meditate and try to have some understanding and perspective because when you get a perspective change, it is so enriching. I did not know that some relationships in my life currently could have ever been this deep. And so I implore you, once those walls come down, it is such a great life out there. So please really give it a pause, give it a thought. Wonderful words. I was going to ask you for your final message, but you've given it, which is brilliant. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't know whether you've given much thought to the possibility of former colleagues and friends and family members watching this interview. Um, what would be your message to them in particular? Oh, that I love them. I mean, there's there's people that I work with at HID and broadcasting that, you know, I've lost uh, inside jokes and almost whole like vernacular of just great rapport. Um, I have nothing but respect with the people, not only the elders that I served on the bodies with, um, the little old uh, Greek lady that used to be in my service group. I love that woman. I love lots of different people. And this had nothing to do with anything that someone in my life, um, but that made me drive me out. I have no animosity. And I don't think less of you. I'll always answer your phone call, but I'm respecting uh, your right to shun me every single day. And that's that's fine. You know, everyone has their own autonomy. But I just want to let you all know that I do love you. I think about you often. That's actually been one of the really interesting elements of, of this conversation from my perspective is, you know, when we we're going through that list of names, uh, you very clearly feel fondness and affection even for some of the governing body members and helpers and um that's that's really interesting to see and it just shows doesn't it that you know cults use people and they use in many cases good loving kind people to do horrendous things you know and <laughs> it's a really sad reality but it's one that we have to deal with couldn't express it better yeah i i do I feel a lot of love for those individuals. And even though they believe certain things that I don't, um, they're good people. They're good people who believe on the left or the right politically. And there's good people that believe in lots of different religions. And so I'm just trying to be more open-minded as I move forward in life. Sure thing. Well, Daniel, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the channel. I'm hopeful uh, that we can have you on again. I'm sure we'll be in need of your insights uh, for future developments, or at least I can foresee that uh, if you're interested. But thank you so much for sharing what you've shared. Of course, be happy to. Thanks for your time. Thank you. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I certainly have. Don't forget that you can watch similar videos by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel. But that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching.